you know, you write a patch for FreeBSD. Um, how do you know that it's not going to break stuff? Um, you know, you can boot it up on one of your computers. You can do all sorts of things, but there's no real, in, in, my, in my opinion, there's no kind of universal tools that you can use. You, you, everyone is kind of left up to do their own sort of thing. And like I've overheard conversations even this morning. People write their own scripts to build VM images to test. Um, so I wanted to present a tool that I've been working on for the past month or so, but I've been thinking about for a lot longer than that. Um, and I'll, yeah, we'll go through that. But first, a bit more motivation. So like I said, FreeBSD source development is almost uniquely challenging. Um, you're developing a whole operating system. So there's a kernel, there's hundreds of utilities, there's libraries, and then that's just the base OS. If you change something in the base system, you might break ports. It's hard to know. Um, so there's a lot of sort of intrinsically complicated aspects to, to FreeBSD source development. Um, on top of that, we have lots of different configurations. You might be running on ARM, x86-64. Uh, you know, maybe you're, you want to test with a particular custom kernel config. Um, there's, you know, huge numbers of combinations of system configurations that you might want to test. Um, and it's, again, kind of painful that we have no canned way to actually deploy FreeBSD. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in the ports tree, we have this tool called Poudrier, which is very, very useful. Um, it handles all the automation needed to kind of build ports in a, in a sanitized environment. Um, it sets up jails for you, it creates ZFS data sets, um, it does lots of uh, caching of build artifacts. Like there's, it's just a very kind of handy one-stop shop for anything you might want to do in the ports tree. So I think source is more complicated. There's a lot of different things one might want to test, but uh, for a long time I've really wanted to have a universal tool that all developers can use uh, in a fashion similar to Poudrier. When you're testing a change, here's you know, some baseline things you can do that are very easy, a single command, and you, know, you get some results. It might take a while, but that's okay. Um, so for folks who are familiar with CherryBSD, um, there is actually a tool that kind of approaches that called CherryBuild. I won't talk about it too much, except that it's, I've, I've stolen some ideas from it, um, and it kind of approaches what I want. It's effectively a very large Python script, which has canned recipes for building all sorts of software uh, that are used in the Cherry ecosystem. So uh, I won't go too much more into it than that, but you know, in order to, to, you know, to boot CherryBSD, you need to build, you need to have a special tool chain, you need a special uh, QMU, you need all these kind of tool chain components. Uh, so CherryBuild is a script which will sort of marshal all of that with a, with a single, single invocation. It's very, very convenient. Um, so when we're trying to test kernel changes, I personally make heavy use of virtual machines. Um, both QMU and Beehive are very useful for that, um, especially for kernel development, just because rebooting hardware takes a long time. It's hard to automate. Um, so I, I tend to leverage virtual machines quite a lot. And I think as far as kind of getting a baseline, pre-commit, CI, whatever you want to call it, some, some kind of test regime um, that is more involved than just building a kernel, um, I think uh, VM images are really useful. So right now we don't have this sort of single blast way to build VM images. Um, uh, there's make release, which currently requires root for at least, it did last time I checked, that might not be true anymore. Um, but it has, its, it has various limitations, and those will maybe be a bit more apparent uh, a bit later as I go into examples of the tool that I wrote. But um, it, what it effectively means is that downstream CI systems of FreeBSD have to reinvent their own solutions a lot of the time. So the Jenkins, uh, the Jenkins builds, you know, have their own scripts for building VM images. I have my own scripts. I'm sure a lot of our other source developers do, and so on. Um, so I wanted to be able to automate. So in much the same way that you can kind of do test port builds with Poudrier, I wanted to make it kind of easy in, in the sense of having a single command which does everything for you uh, to run the regression test suite, um, other test suites that we have. So there's one called Stress2, uh, which is really useful for some, some types of kernel changes. There's a system called Fuzzer called Syscaller, which is really useful for testing, again, certain types of kernel changes. Um, all these things today take a lot of effort to set up. There's no sort of blessed tools for that. 
Um, so yeah, just to demonstrate how challenging it is to actually run the regression test suite today if you wanted to, um, you need about 20 different packages. I can show you the list. It's hard coded in a few different places, but uh, yeah, the list is right here. So just to run the test suite on FreeBSD, you need Core Utils, Python, some other Python stuff, Perl, KSH, um, you know, and, and that knowledge isn't encoded anywhere. You just have to run the test suite and see which tests are skipped because we don't have certain things installed. Go and install them, run again, and figure it out like that. Um, so, you know, hard coding it here is not the best solution, but um, having it in kind of one tool that knows how to do everything so developers don't need to figure it out over and over, I think is a useful step forward. And similarly, to run the test suite, you need a whole bunch of kernel modules loaded if you want to get all of your, uh, if, if you want to kind of test everything. So similarly, if you want to test PF, you need to actually explicitly load PF, otherwise all your tests will be skipped. It's not very nice. Um, yeah, so, and one of the other goals of my tool is to be useful for both interactive and CI environments. So if you're developing something, you want a really tight feedback loop, you want to be able to build and test and get some results, and then edit, compile, test again um, as quickly as possible. Uh, so you can, and you know, do other interactive things like attach a debugger to a VM without having to figure out where, you know, the path of the kernel is, the path of the kernel symbols are, which port the GDB stub is listening on. All these kinds of details are not really important. Uh, but at the same time, it's a script, it's got a command line interface, it's very regular. Um, you can do a lot of things with it uh, in the sense that, you know, once it starts running, uh, you can just kind of leave it alone and watch the output. And you get a result at the end. So uh, my attempt at this is a script called Bricolé. In the fine tradition we have of naming uh, tools after French words, uh, Bricolé is a French verb, which I believe means to tinker, basically to, you know, to play around with, to, to experiment with. I don't think it has any negative connotations, not that I found, but if, any, if it does, please let me know. Uh, it's just a name, I don't know. Uh, it's a Lewis script. Um, it tries to have very few dependencies, uh, so it actually wraps a whole bunch of system calls and libc functions, and that's it. Oh, and it uses a library uh, written by Kyle Evans, which kind of provides an expect-like interface, except it's all done in Lua, so it's a bit nicer to integrate. Uh, that's called orc, which I believe is short for orchestrate. Uh, so that's it. So when you download the, the repo if, on a FreeBSD system, uh, just type make, and it'll do everything for you. Uh, so yeah, you just need Lua 5.4 and CMake. And then some of the things you might actually do with it will require other packages. Uh, so Bricolet is just a, a little framework that's a bit more structured than having a bunch of shell scripts which do different things. Uh, so the idea is to have, you know, a bunch of reusable units of work that you might want to execute during development. And those are called tasks. Um, but in general, that would correspond to me to uh, uh, like a single script. So for instance, I have a task which lets me run the FreeBSD regression test suite against a FreeBSD source tree. So there's a few subtasks involved there. You have to get a copy of the FreeBSD source tree or update the existing one. And you know, to do that, you need to know which branch you wanna pull from, which repository, you know, uh, maybe you don't want to actually clone it, maybe you just want to use an existing clone that's already somewhere in the file system. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of parameters there already. After that, you need to build a VM image. So you need to run build world, build kernel, install world, install kernel. Uh, so, and you might want to inject various source.conf options. You might want to set a custom kernel config. Um, yeah, there's, again, a whole, a whole other sort of set of parameters there. Uh, then you need to actually build a VM image. So first you need to build a file system image, usually either ZFS or UFS. Um, and you need to make a disk image out of that. So again, a few steps. And then you need to actually boot it. Um, so again, which hypervisor do you wanna use? How much memory do you wanna give it? How many CPUs? Uh, there's all these parameters that you might wanna adjust. So doing all that with shell scripts is pretty painful. Um, you know, when you, like we, we use a lot of shell and make based tooling in the project. Um, and I think that's convenient, but it's not very friendly. If you mistype a variable name, 
in your command line, usually, you know, there's no checking for that. Uh, like if I type kern conf instead of, like, you know, if I, if I skip one letter in kern conf, it's just going to build the default kernel, and I won't know unless I check. So that's that's not nice. And that's one of the reasons I use Lua instead of shell. Um, so all of these four tasks, getting the source tree, building, building FreeBSD, uh, building a FreeBSD image, and actually booting a VM, those are all tasks in, uh, in this framework. So for instance, uh, I might want to boot a VM that runs the regression test suite. I might want to boot a VM image that just gives me an interactive prompt. Maybe it runs a different test suite. Maybe it does some custom thing. Uh, the whole point is to not, you know, write the same code over and over to do that sort of stuff. So to give one example, you know, maybe I want to build a VM image and boot it interactively, but I want it to be an ARM64 image, and I want it to have a KSAN kernel, and I want the root file system to be ZFS, and I want Emacs to be pre-installed for some reason. So that's the sort of thing I can do. And then, you know, I want to attach a debug to the hypervisor. I don't want to figure out which port it's listening on. I don't want to figure out where the kernel is. I just want it to work. And uh, one of the other requirements was uh, I don't want it to use root privileges unless it really needs to. So in particular, right now, if you run it without, with root privileges, it'll give you an error. Um, that's probably a bit too strict because you might want to use it in a jail. But uh, the point is that you might want to be able to run this on some shared system where you don't have root privileges and still get some utility out of it. So in the FreeBSD cluster, we have systems that are used for building FreeBSD. Uh, and they have QMU and they have everything you need installed, uh, but you don't have root. So I want to be able to use this framework there. Um, I've been working a bit on getting unprivileged Beehive to work. Uh, so I have some patches which add like a, a device interface so that you can create and destroy, VM, uh, destroy VMs. Right now you need a syscontrol to do that, which is why it requires root. But uh, hopefully in the next month or so, I'll have the ability at least, you, if you want, you can configure your system to allow unprivileged Beehive uh, without, without certain features like PCI pass-through, but um, enough to make the rest of this useful. And then uh, I don't know if folks have noticed in the past year or so, I added a, a new network backend, which is kind of similar to user networking in QMU. Uh, so there's like, it's basically like a user space network stack um, that's good enough to let you SSH into a VM without having to create a network interface, without having to find an IP address, all that kind of stuff. Oh, so are there any questions so far? Is like, am I being concrete enough? I'm gonna show some demos at the end of my slides, which will be over pretty quickly. But um, kind of the point of the talk is just to demonstrate my solution at this. Like I really want this tool. It doesn't have to be exactly like this. Um, I just want something that does these things. So if folks have opinions on what the UI for such a tool should look like, you know, if, if there's any disagreement or any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about it because I'd really like other folks to start using something like this. Um, you know, when you're taking pull requests from users off of GitHub, it'd be really great if you could, you know, run it through a tool that just does a whole bunch of checking for you without having to, you know, think too hard about it. Uh, so that's, that's, really, that's really my goal here. And I'm not tied too much to this particular implementation, but I, I really, really think that, like, as, as you know, FreeBSD source developers, we really need a better baseline than what we have today. So this kind of ties into the discussions uh, we've had for the past while over pre-commit CI. Um, and here's, again, just my attempt at it. So I'm, I'm very interested in criticism. Uh, so just some of the basic ideas before I launch into demos. Um, as I said, you know, the, the sort of basic abstraction in Bricolet is a task. A task is just some reusable piece of logic. Um, some parts of the task are defined declaratively. Uh, so it has inputs, which are the outputs of other tasks. So for instance, there's a task to clone a Git repository. Its output is the path to that repository. Uh, there's a task to run FreeBSD make targets. So like build world, build kernel. The input is a FreeBSD Git repository. The output is an object directory and maybe a staging directory if you've installed it somewhere. So that stuff is all declared uh, in a task definition. And just to make it really visceral, I'll show you an example. Well, just going back to this one, uh, there's a task which builds a FreeBSD VM image. There's a whole bunch of metadata. 
So there's, you can see, you know, just using Lua tables, I can define inputs and parameters. This one doesn't have any outputs, I guess, which is a bit counterintuitive, but anyway. Um, so you can see, for instance, uh, one of the parameters is a list of kernel modules that will get loaded when this image is booted. Uh, you can define things like the size of the M image. You can say, you can provision SSH users so that it's possible to SSH into the VM as root. Uh, so it'll generate SSH keys to do that. So that's this sort of declarative component. And then there's a function called run, which in this particular case doesn't do very much. Um, oh, I see, yeah, because this is, this is actually a derived class. So yeah, sorry, this is, this is the script for building a, a, a VM image specifically for running the regression test suite, and it reuses most of the code from the, from the sort of base VM image task. So all this one does is set a couple of syscontrols that you need in order to run uh, the test suite with full coverage, and it'll make sure that certain packages are installed and certain kernel modules are installed. And then, you know, when the test suite is running, it's useful to be able to SSH in and have a look, so you can do that. So, right, so the actual implementation of the task is in a function called run. Um, it takes a table as input, which has all the inputs and parameters bound to its keys, so you, know, you can use them uh, in, your, in your sort of execution logic. Um, each task, when it runs, gets its own working directory, so it can save its output files there. Um, there's a command line syntax, a sort of unifi uniform command line syntax for actually running a task. Um, and again, I'll, I'll show, some, show some examples very shortly. Um, aside from actually running the task, you can do sort of auxiliary things like attaching a debugger to a running VM. Um, you can SSH into a VM. Again, you don't need to know anything about how it's running. Like, it just needs to be running, and then you can run this command that lets you SSH. And it's, so it tries really hard to stay out of your way. Um, and that's, that's really the, the goal, right? I want it to be easy to use. I want it to be, easy, like, discoverable. Um, so again, if you just run recurly run, it'll show you all the tasks it can run. The output is, it's not very nice. I think I need a nicer, nicer way to present this information. Um, but you know, you get a name of the target and uh, a little description of what it does. So if, for instance, I decide I want to fuzz FreeBSD using syscaller, um, I can select that target and then get a list of all the parameters that it takes. And so you can see there's quite a lot, but those are all defaults. And the point is to give you sane defaults so that you don't have to fuss with them in order to do something basic. But you know, if you want to fuzz something other than AMD64, you can say, well, uh, so the, the parameter, I'll show in a sec once I've typed this out. Actually, maybe a better example is, you know, instead of using QMU as the hypervisor for syscaller, you want to use Beehive. So I can't see very well. Okay. So here on the bottom, I don't know if folks can see this more or less. The, the, the syntax is basically just the task name, and then a colon, and then the parameter name, and then an equal sign, and the value. So, if I update the list of parameters on the command line like this, then you can see now, okay, the hypervisor is beehive, it's set on the command line, and then if I remove that show flag, it'll actually go do the thing. At least it should. It might do something else. I've been mucking with it a lot this morning. Oh, yeah, and okay, so I'm not gonna use beehive because you actually need to do some extra setup for this one. Um, but. So what it's doing right now is it's going off and building syscaller, then it's gonna go off and build FreeBSD, then it's gonna go and build a FreeBSD image, and then it's gonna go start syscaller, which itself starts VMs. Um, it does things like it'll do incremental builds by default, uh, which I think is the same behavior for pretty much any build system, but FreeBSD does clean builds by default, um, which wastes a lot of time. So you can see that in the, in the make invocation at the top of the screen, there's a whole bunch of parameters that are getting set. So things like the kernel configuration or custom, um, you don't have to tell it 
yeah, so the, the, there's a lot of noise here because we print a lot of warnings during incremental builds for some reason, but um, I promise it's pretty fast. So maybe I'll let this run in the background. Give it a few, just four CPUs. And so one of the other things I wanted to do with this project is evaluate the use of Lua as a kind of glue language in the base system instead of shell. Um, so we have Flua in the base system. It's used for a few small things, but um, I think its adoption is held back a bit by the fact that we have no real system libraries for it. So if you want to do things like, you know, spawn a command, I think there is now a library function for that, but like there's a lot of basic things that are just not there. Um, so a lot of system call wrappers are missing. A lot of libc function call wrappers are missing. Um, and it's not a lot of work to, to add them, but there needs to be some discussion about what the interface, like kind of how to, how to namespace things, what, what modules we want to provide, how to document them, all that sort of thing. Um, but as part of this project, and because I was trying to, you know, create as few dependencies as possible, I wrote a whole bunch of those system call wrappers. So think for things like POSIX spawn, um, make temp, like all those kind of classic libc functions, um, and maybe around 20 or 30 or so system call wrappers for things that I needed. Um, so even things like make dir. Um, so uh, that's been very smooth. Um, I'm, I'm really encouraged by how easy it is to create little extensions in C. Um, that's not, you know, a novel discovery, but for me it was, it was a useful exercise to, to kind of go through it and see how hard it was. Um, so I'm, I'll be really interested for the rest of the conference if anyone talks, wants to talk about Lua and the base system um, and how to approach that and making that more, more of a, a force, so to speak. Um, I'd be really interested in doing that. Because I think having base, base system libraries for, you know, beehive management, jail management, interface management, PF, um, creating bindings for all the libraries, the C libraries that we have in the base system would be a really worthy uh, project. Um, but it needs, it needs some planning. So I'll show a few more examples in a bit. Um, but right now the code is on GitHub if anyone wants to try it. Um, like I said, it, you, need, you need Lua 5.4 and CMake. And when you clone it, just type make and it'll build everything. It has to be done on a FreeBSD system at the moment. Um, hopefully that's, that's not too much of a restriction. Um, and yeah, I'd be really happy to hear any feedback or kind of any, any experiences people have. Uh, I will say that the doc documentation is really sparse right now, um, but I'm planning to work on it you know, during this conference. And so I think in a week or two, it'll be in a much better state. I've started writing a man page and there's you know, a, fair much, a fair bit of inline descriptions of various tasks in the code itself, but the UI it's, is still being kind of worked on. Uh, so does anyone have any questions? I'm going to show some more stuff, but Warner's got something. And I have some I can relay from, I'll relay two from IRC, well, a comment from IRC first. Okay. Just Baptiste gave you, like, hands for your name. Both Baptiste and Manor fully approved. I think I mean, Baptiste also sent you hearts for a bricolet. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks, um, Baptiste. <laughs> uh, I have a question I'll do, but I'll let Warner go first. So uh, Flua and Base. Uh -huh. uh, last year, I had a summer of code student that uh, parallel or um, used Lua to write the scripts to boot every possible boot combination that we have, but um, switched to Python at the end because uh, we don't have a basically a spawn or a way to do multiple threads. So. Oh well, multiple threads. Mm. I want to spawn all 20 of these in parallel because oh, yeah, they, yeah. they don't do anything yeah. and then wait for them to finish. So. Oh, so sorry. Uh, I'll go back to this in a minute. So syscaller is running now. Um, but like, uh, so for instance, I have this POSIX spawn wrapper that I wrote in C um, and you know, you, so, and, and I'm using waitpid, so this is like a synchronous spawn and run, but like, yeah, if you wanted to do that in Lua, all you need is this thing which I wrote. Um, it's not in Flua, but I, I'd like to import it. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like that because I, I like his Flua um, version of the scripts better than the other stuff. So I, I yeah. think that also might be something to integrate with your stuff. 
Because, you know, just my, my personal feelings are Lua is actually a pretty nice language. It's very simple. Um, the thing that it, it's really weak at is providing libraries, which is the thing that, or one thing that Python is really, really good at. Um, so I think, you know, unless we're going to adopt Python in the base system, if we want something, if we want something better than, than shell scripts and make files, which I at least do, um, we need to at least start with, you know, some C, C wrappers. And like there's, there's third party projects on the internet that have done this. There's something called Lua POSIX, which provides a whole bunch of like POSIX compatible system call wrappers. They don't have POSIX spawn P, which is kind of annoying. Um, and that's part of the reason I didn't use it. But um, it would also be very nice to, to be able to use, you know, Capsicum from Lua, all these kinds of FreeBSD specific features. Um, but yeah, I think I, starting with these libc functions is a good way to start. I, I wanted to rewrite config in Lua. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you, and, and I think you probably could do most of it today, right? It's just not as convenient as it could be because our libraries aren't, yeah. aren't really there. Let me do a question from IRC first. Um, Andy Turner asked about um, building an artifact on one system and then doing the execution on another. Is that kind of doable? Is it somewhat kind of uh, manually know to copy the bits to the right place? Or? Yeah, today it's not really doable. Um, not out of the box. Like, you could certainly implement some wrapper on top of Replay to do that. Um, I mean, I think if it was phrased a bit more precisely, I could probably see that as like a feature request. Like, oh, you know, add an optional step to copy to SCP build artifacts from place A to place B or to rsync them or like whatever. I, I don't know exactly how that would look, but the whole point is like, Brickle is a glorified command run, runner, right? Like, you know, it, it can do anything you want it to do. It's just uh, a question of, you know, framing that in terms of a workflow. Like if, if you have some, yeah, if, if that can be kind of fit into the hierarchy in a way that makes sense, then like, you know, that, that's very easy to implement. But, um, yeah, I guess I'd wonder, like, do you want to do that after you build the VM image? Like, do you want to copy that over? Do you want to copy just the build artifacts? Like, so it's, I think his, his yeah. use cases are, I want to build on a fast machine and run on a slow machine. Or maybe, like, cross-build on a fast x86 box and then go run it on my ARM box. Um, or, yeah. like, I think he mentioned also being able to do one of the two steps on Linux, either running Qmule Linux or maybe building on, I think it's more like running Qmule Linux, but I think it's kind of separating the notion of building in versus when I actually go to run things. Yeah. I mean, so like th there's a natural separation in the, in, the, in the framework itself, right? Like building a VM image and booting it are two separate things. They don't need to be connected to each other. So yeah, it's just kind of a question of how, how exactly you want to support that. Um, so I, I don't, I personally have a very fast AMD machine at home that I use for everything. And then I use VMs to do most of the stuff that I want to do with this tool. So I, I haven't experienced the need for that yet, but I can see why. I can see why you'd want to. Oh, okay. Okay, so I guess, yeah, cross, cross system building is a pretty interesting topic for some people. Do you have any plans for building this into a more of a CI model? So the, the, my hope is that folks could take this and use it directly from their CI scripts um, because, you know, the command line interface is such that, you know, everything is described in the command line. Um, there's no support yet for adding a config file, which I think you'd really want for a CI system, but that's, that's just, I, I can do that very quickly. It's just... Uh, I haven't yet because I haven't quite figured out how I want it to look. But, you know, instead of specifying all these parameters on the command line and, you know, getting them from a config file, that's easy to do, yeah. Um, so my, my hope is that, yes, one could, one could use this in a CI environment. And, and I tried to design it with those kinds of affordances in mind. I, I think as a, as a project, it would be very useful to have some sort of CI service because a lot of us in this room have access to fast hardware that we can build and test things on, but there are a lot of people that are not in this room but want to contribute to FreeBSD. Some of them don't even have FreeBSD systems at all. Um, but you know, those that do, it may be a small system. They don't want to spend five hours building something on a laptop. So if there was some, some way that they could just you know send a patch somewhere and have it tested for them. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you know, we need to make sure they're not, not testing Bitcoin mining. But 
I, 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 I do think it would be very useful to have some sort of service for, for people to access. Yeah. You don't submit a pull request for it. Oh, yes, yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 So, in, in your Cirrus scripts, yeah, you could download this tool because that's so Cirrus is a CI service that, or hosted CI that lets you target FreeBSD as a native platform, which I think is the main appeal of it for us. And you also, you, you also get some amount of free credits per month, I think. Um, so one thing you could very easily do is, you know, just clone this repository as the first step of your build process and use it instead of hard coding, you know, your make build world, make build kernel, whatever, whatever else you want to do. Um, so I think, yeah, that would probably be the ideal way to use it in CI. Um, so to, to Colin's point, yeah, it would be nice if there was some kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, an orchestration layer on top that takes idle CPU resources and, and uses this tool to, to do builds and so on. But I would say that's a bit out of scope for what this thing is trying to do because that sort of resource allocation is a bit, like, that's something I, like we, we have the universe machines in the FreeBSD cluster. Um, and you can run this there, I've been doing it, and you know, use it to generate emails periodically, for instance. Um, but you know, how do you make sure it's not over-provisioned? If four people are doing the same uh, workload and you're running VMs, you know, if you're running compilers and VMs on the same system and the CPUs are oversubscribed, you're gonna have you're gonna have a bad time. So there's a need for I think an additional layer to do orchestration on top of this. Uh, uh, I'm thinking particularly of contributors that are not tomatoes. So uh, contributors who aren't tomatoes don't have access to the universe. Right. So so yeah, Colin points out that yeah, committer or contributors who aren't committers won't have access to universe. Um, but that, that may be a good place to stage builds for patches from contributors. Uh, but that would require some kind of exclusive access to the systems. Um, so I, I don't know if, if there's some support planned for this. Uh, oh, how much time do we have left? 20 minutes, okay. Um, I've noticed the universe machines are also very slow. Like there's Sandy Bridge, um, which is, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know if as part of the cluster refresh that I think Joe mentioned, there might be access to, to newer hardware for doing builds, um, but this might be a, a really good use for that. Because as far as I know, the universe systems are mostly idle. People don't really use them. Um, but yeah, again, if you use this today, you can, you know, you can run the test suite without having to do much, um, so long as there aren't other people you know, running builds at the same time as you. So I guess the short answer to your question is yes, but I think there's some stuff that needs to happen at a higher layer um, to, to provision resources to run this tool. So does anybody have a way we can run FreeBSD native jobs on GitHub? Yes. So if you do a self-hosted GitHub runner, um, I think David Chisnell wrote some scripts whereby you can like, there, there's a project which kind of implements the like GitHub runner API that's defined by GitHub. I think, I guess they reverse engineered it. And so you can use that to run GitHub Actions in your local environment. And I've done it and it kind of works, but I think it has a, there's a lot of security implications if you're turning that on a, on a repo where other people can, you know. Yeah, well we, 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 we yeah. CIRC, yeah. I, I haven't tried it in, in maybe, it was like maybe last year that I tried it. So th there is, you can do it. Like you basically define a FreeBSD jail and run the agent there and it'll do builds and stuff for you. And yeah, it, it mostly I'd, works. I'd like to get that turned up for our GitHub pull request stuff. And this looks like it would drop into that yeah. nicely. Yeah. But our GitHub pull request stuff, the problem is that we're not providing resources. Yeah. One way or another, we have to provide resources to actually run the project. Um, and it can't be Cirrus. So we can pay Cirrus, pay for Google Cloud or whatever the heck we want. Or we can buy our own. Well, I think also, so Baptiste mentioned, I think the thing you were talking about, Mark, the re-implementation of GitHub's actions. Um, I, I think what we're kind of describing is 
for example, you could host that on our universe machines. And then maybe we do something like a, a specific label that a committer has to tag on a PR before we'll actually run it to try to constrain and have something that scrapes our pull request to see if something is labeled in a certain way and so then kind of schedules it to run on the universe machines that way and feeds back maybe something along those lines perhaps. But I think a lot of this, though, is a lot of the orchestration is a layer on top of Bricolay as opposed to an intrinsic feature of, of Bricolay itself, right? I think one of the, th when I've spoken with Mark, one of the design goals that I would appreciate about this is the ability for myself at least to run CI locally before I push something as a developer, um, which is, you know, that's orthog that's one part of the puzzle as opposed to the validating, providing a good way to validate external contributions and giving us confidence about being able to kind of more automate, valid, um, do automated validation or improved validation of external contributions so you feel better about pushing things that we haven't written. Are there any more questions? Yep. Uh, yes, Mark, I, I was wondering, um, for some of the tasks where you spawn VMs, um, actually, uh, can we choose, um, for example, to launch a QEMU or a Beehive uh, can can we switch backends, and w would you consider as well um, some patches to to have a virtual box as a backend? Uh, can we switch backends? Y yes, yeah, you can do it today. Um, so sorry, because I have to. I can't. It's not a mirrored display, so I have to <laughs> turn my head to type anything. But uh, uh, ch -ch -ch. I'm just trying to find an example here. Uh, okay, so. Well, you were running Beehive before when it gave that nice error message about not having a ZFS pool set up. Yeah. So, okay. So here's, here's an Ampere system um, courtesy of Clara, which I've been using to test Beehive-related stuff. Um, so I'm logged into it right now over FreeBSD Wi-Fi. And, yeah, so, again, the, like... I, I don't love this syntax, so again, any hints on the UI would be really appreciated, but you can see there's FreeBSD source, regression suite run, hypervisor equals Beehive. So by default, it'll use QMU, but yeah, if you wanted to add a virtual box backend, that, that would be fine too, as long as you can do it through the command line. There's, again, because it's Lua, it's a bit primitive, like, I ha, I, like Lua doesn't have classes, so I had to write classes. Like I have to make my own kind of abstraction for that. So there's you know a base VM run task or class and then there's some specific methods for Beehive and QMU. So yeah, you could you could easily you could easily add something for for VirtualBox as well. Um, so in this particular example, um, you know, there's a few other parameters. I ask it for 32 gigabytes of memory, 16 CPUs, um, and instead of running the whole regression test suite, I just want to run the bin sh tests. So if I do that, um, you know, you can see it kind of running. It'll update the source tree because it's, it's pointing at the, the canonical FreeBSD sources. So every time somebody commits um, and you run this, you'll get the updates. And now it does an incremental rebuild. Um, there's a lot of weird noise in our incremental builds, like that find. I don't know what that's about. Lots of annoying dependency errors. Anyway, so this, this takes maybe 30 seconds, um, even though the hardware is pretty fast. So one of the other things I'd like to improve is just the ability to avoid even going through this incremental rebuild when possible because uh, it's, it's pretty slow. Um, but you can see it's already on the kernel. Now it's installing everything. Some more find errors. Yeah. Go, go, go. Um, and so while that's running, I'll go to a previous tab where I wanted to show an example, but they shut off the power at home. So I was running the RISC-V regression test suite, um, and it actually panicked. And so when the regression test suite panics, um, you know, it stops in the debugger. But what I was able to do uh, was basically from another, another terminal just attach a debugger. So the, the, the syntax was basically just bricolay run 
you know, FreeBSD source regression test suite GDB. And then it would attach a debugger to this VM and you can get a backtrace and start debugging. Um, so again, my, my session is lost, unfortunately, but um, it, like, that, that's the kind of thing I really want it to be easy to do. So if you run the FreeBSD regression test suite and you hit a bug, you know, you can give your invocation to somebody else and hopefully they can reproduce it without, without a lot of work on their part. You don't have to, you know, give them any scripts. You don't have to make a whole bunch of assumptions about their environment. Um, all of that kind of messy logic is handled in the, in the framework. Okay, so it booted up the VM. It's installing a whole bunch of packages, nested tmux, there we go. So this is, this is ARM64 Beehive. Um, you can see it has all the 16 CPUs, it has 32 gigs of memory, and it's going and running the tests, and it's very fast because it runs them in parallel by default. Um, and then it generates a report and copies it back to the host system. So having done that, I can now run this command at the bottom, wherein, you know, I, I name the same task again, and then I add kind of a subcommand report, um, which you could, you know, for instance, paste into an email, and then that's just the queue of, queue of results of the test. It's not very interesting because all the tests passed, but um, all of the details you'd kind of want are there. It's actually a lot of output, but yeah. So yeah, ran 506 tests, no failures, great. Then SH has no bugs. Um, <laughs> That's a bold claim. But, but like, ho hopefully the, the, the utility is kind of a, a bit more clear, right? Like, I, to, to do this kind of thing using sys or tools in the base system, like, I'd, I have to write a whole bunch of scripts. Um, um, but having a bit, of, a bit of a framework that's not too intrusive, um, that lets you kind of create that lets each task run its own working directory, that lets you, know, lets you define parameter namespaces and so on, um, I think makes things a lot easier. So, uh, yeah. I don't think I have too much else to show. I have syscaller running over here. Um, I can try to show that. I don't know why it keeps trying to open Slack. I don't want it to do that. So this is just syscaller running on, uh, on my laptop. Um, but again, I didn't have to do anything. Like I just typed in the command and gave it a couple of parameters and it just figured, out, figured it all out. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the spirit of the tool, right? Like it lets you sort of incrementally discover what's possible because it gives you ways to list all the tasks, list all the parameters to the task. It tries to not give you too much information which I think is a problem with cherry build. Um, if you want to list, like, you know, the usage message for cherry build is like thousands of lines long. So in this case, we have more of a sort of hierarchical namespace of parameters where you can, where you can separate parameters that relate to checking out a source tree from parameters that relate to booting up a VM because those are different things. So uh, I think that's all I really wanted to show. Uh, yeah. Oh, and I have stress two running. Um, uh, so again, stress two is just another FreeBSD test suite. Um, there's nothing really magical about it, but we have no tools to actually run it. If you want to run stress two today, you need to know, you know, where to copy the test suite from, how to build it. You know, all sorts of details are not really interesting. Um, but with Bricolay, you can just, you can just kind of specify a few parameters and have it go. And here I can demonstrate the GDB thing. So I have it running in one terminal. Um, and then there's this FreeBSD source stress to run. Sorry about that. I'm almost done anyway. So now I have a GDB attached to the VM. The VM has stopped. You know, you can see one of the CPUs was uh, acquiring a reference to a, to a jail. Okay, I mean, that's not intrinsically useful, but um, being able to, to attach a debugger like this after a crash is, is, is pretty nice. And so because the VM runs under ORC, which again is this kind of expect-like expect framework, um, you can do expect-like things, so you can match on 
particular patterns in the console messages. So one patch I have, which I haven't committed yet, but um, seems to work, is if the kernel panics, it'll automatically detect that, and it can you know, run a bunch of debugging commands, get more output, and save that, um, again, all automatically, which is something we don't really, we, we don't have kind of canned tools for today. So hopefully, if, if like me, you do a lot of kernel development, um, hopefully you can see the utility there. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's all I had to show. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you very much, Mark. Yep.